Good afternoon. Happy Mother's Day to those of you that are watching that are mothers or grandmothers, and, and we appreciate you spending a little bit of your Sunday with us, whether you are or are not a mother. Um, thank you all for joining us. My name is Pat Kowitzel. I'm the buyer and author program coordinator at Magic City Books. And we are really excited uh, for today's virtual author program. We, we largely do these on weeknights and we had an opportunity to kind of be able to squeeze one in on a Sunday afternoon today. And we're really excited about this book, The Secret History of Home Economics. And, uh, and, it's, and the book's author, Danielle Dillinger. And we are just uh, really excited to, to hear more about her book today. We have a lot of author programs coming this week, uh, specifically, and, and throughout the rest of May, uh, a lot of stuff that's going on. And so if this is the first time that you're, jo you're joining us for an author program, we welcome you and encourage you to check out magiccitybooks.com for all of our upcoming programs. We have one every night this week. Um, Monday, uh, we're going to be talking to the editor of a new book about Bob Dylan and uh, with some of the access to the Bob Dylan archive here in Tulsa. Tuesday, we've got a debut author here, a local debut author, um, Casey Bizet and her young adult novel. Wednesday, we're going to be talking to Carl Hyacin. Thursday, Dr. Suzanne Coven about um, her book on uh, kind of advice for young female doctors. And then on Friday, the nonfiction writer David uh, Daniel James Brown for his new book, Facing the Mountain, about Japanese Americans during World War II. So it's a jam-packed week, uh, something for just about every kind of reader, and we hope that you'll come back and join us again for one of those programs. Um, so we first saw uh, Danielle's book on the Norton kind of list uh, as a, my position as author program coordinator and buyer. I get an opportunity to see the forthcoming books kind of early and stuff. And so um, one of the things, I mean, this book really jumped out to us and selected it for our May uh, subscription box for kind of history and current events. And, and we just thought that this was a, a really timely and, and interesting book um, that might not necessarily be seen by every reader all that easily or, or be seen uh, every time that you walk into a, a bookstore or are shopping online, but something that we could uh, identify as being something that we were really excited about. And so, and so we picked it for that. And then uh, the opportunity came to be able to host Danielle for the, for the program today. Danielle is a former New Orleans Times-Picune education reporter and a Knight Wallace journalism fellow. She also worked for the wrote for the Boston Globe and worked at the Boston NPR station. Um, this book, uh, you know, home economics it might conjure traumatic memories of <laughs> hand-sewn pillows or sunken muffins, and uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. And and, and really interesting. And, you know, um, when you see that book in the bookstore, The Secret History of Something, that's one that should, there's a reason that they're named that way. And, and uh, it's almost always that there's a lot more to that story. And so today, we're also joined by uh, the, the journalist Nina McLaughlin, and uh, she is the author of Hammerhead, The Making of a Carpenter. She's formerly an editor at the Boston Phoenix and has written for The Believer, Book Slut, and Los Angeles Review of Books and elsewhere. And so I am going to be passing it off to Nina, who will uh, be directing the conversation today and enjoy the program. Thanks again for joining us. Um, thank you, Pat, and thanks to all of uh, Magic City Books. It's really, I was delighted to be invited to do this, um, and I'm excited to talk with Danielle uh, about this book, which is really, really fantastic. Um, let me just first say that um, if you guys have questions, please feel free to float them at any time. Um, I'll sort of be looking in and out of the, the Q&A box. Um, you'll find if you go to the bottom, bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A icon um, and you can tap in your questions and I'll sort of be pulling, pulling from them as, as we go. Um, and we're gonna start um, with Danielle is gonna read um, a chunk of the book to begin. Hey, well, thank you guys all for coming. I'm so glad that you could make it. Um, Mother's Day, whether that is a fun day for you or rough day for you. Um, my own mother is uh, currently having lunch with her other daughter and her granddaughter, but I'm wearing her shirt. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, one of those like, oh, what a nice sweater. Here, honey, you take it. Yeah, shirts. <laughs> and I'm going to read a small piece of the book that 
is, I think shows exactly how far home economics has been from our stereotypes of it. In October, 1938, Luzanne Mamer, a Rural Electrification Administration home demonstration specialist, steered her blue Ford convertible and trailer off the road and onto a field in Anamosa, Iowa. She and her male colleague were loaded down with appliances, refrigerators, stoves, agricultural trimmers, a chicken brooder, irons, along with stacks of pamphlets and two circus tents. Less than two years before, the local farmers had formed the Maquoketa Valley Electric Cooperative, transforming their lives. Now Mamer would show others why and how to do the same. She was debuting the Electric Circus, her idea to educate and entertain rural families. As late as 1935, more than eight of 10 US farms were still in the dark. Mamer knew that life all too well. All her childhood, she had mowed, raked, and hauled timber from the Illinois River bottomlands like a man using heavy Belgian horses. She'd had to, her father needed her labor, but so did her mother. And thus Mamer also minded her siblings, tended the two acre vegetable garden, canned for winter, churned butter, baked bread and butchered on top of studying. In her spare minutes, she cracked pecans to sell so she could afford college. All sans electricity, sans running water, she said later. She arrived at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1927 with a modern equivalent of $14,000 from pecans, a fashionable suntan, unfashionable broad shoulders, a walk that cut through the quad like a harrow through a field, and a plan to be a writer, which became a bit of a problem. Mamer, a realist, faced the facts in her elegant Georgian dorm in her sophomore year. Although she was an honor student, she didn't stand much of a chance of getting a job in journalism. Editors thought women's nerves, women's nerves were too fragile for deadline pressure. Her Women in Journalism book warned her to specialize in an area that demands the distinctly feminine background and experience, such as beauty, shopping, tearjerker stories, or advice for moms. The career disparities were clear in what happened to the university's journalism grads. The men went to the Chicago Tribune and the Associated Press. The women went to the church altar. Maybe Mamer could have been the exception, but she wouldn't risk it. Her family hadn't recovered from the post-war agricultural price drop, and her uncles were bunking with her parents on the farm. Plus, she had to admit, she didn't really have anything to say. She decided to change her major to home economics. That way, she would learn something to write about and have a career where she didn't have to compete with men. Mamer was a smart cookie, and she made a smart call. That's great. Thank you. Um, I want to I want to talk about Mothers and Mother's Day in a minute, but but there's a there's a chunk in that section where you write about there's this description of of doing of doing laundry, for example. And you and I were speaking the other day, and I was telling you about this book that I was reading, where this the author was sort of celebrating um, drudge work, essentially, sort of sort of really um, uh, highlighting and sort of um, yeah, again celebrating cleaning and mopping and all the sort of daily chores. And you made this really interesting point saying drudgery now is way different than <laughs> drudgery just sort of, you know, 50, 70, 80 years ago. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what the sort of physical differences between what it was to sort of do this work now versus let's say 80 years ago. Definitely, definitely. So, you know, I think that one of the, there's sort of two points to this. One is that I think that, you know, we taking care of a home, taking care of people we love, like that can be really satisfying and really meaningful. Um, and people, you know, of there, that's not like a woman's prerogative. People of all genders can feel that way. Um, but one of the, the goals that the founding home economists had, and this was in you know the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, early 1900s, was to eliminate what they called drudgery from the home and to make taking care of the house easier and faster um, so that women could spend time doing other things such as studying, such as working for pay, spending more time with their children. And that's because housework was just extraordinarily arduous. So this is something, I, I read a history of housework um, 
gosh, years and years ago. And there's a great book called More Work for Mother uh, by historian Ruth Cowan that's about this. It's, it was, I mean, there's a reason that even when you read like novels about the 19th century and the early 20th century, that even people who were middle class had household help. And that's because it was, you know, to, to get, to heat your house and cook your food, you had to make a fire in a stove and keep it going all day, whether that was wood or coal. And you had to get that wood or coal, often split it, stack it if it was wood, bring it into your house clean because these are very dirty fuels. And that's just, I mean, you had to do that all the time. So many people didn't have water, running water in their homes. They had to get water every drop of water they used, they had to haul it up from a well or from a tap in like a communal tap in the tenement courtyard. So, I mean, there's wash day, you know, I live in New Orleans, we have rice and beans on washed, red, red beans on wash day, because that was something you could put on the back of the stove because you spent all day doing the wash. And in fact, you had to do another day because you'd hang it out to dry and you'd iron it on the second day and your iron didn't plug in. Your iron was an eight pound hunk of metal that you heated on the stove. So this was just, I mean, there's nothing fun about this. And so the home economist wanted to make all of that easier and more hygienic and see, you know, what you could outsource and then you know, speaking of laundry, they were interested in the working conditions of people who worked in laundromats because who were often women of color or immigrants, you know, women who didn't have a lot of choice in what they were going to do with their time to make sure that their work was hygienic and that they weren't, you know, busting their backs doing the work for other people. Sure. God. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, it's, it's sort of, it, it, reminds me what what we take or what I guess what I take for granted, you know, thinking about like, oh, a vacuum, oh, running water, you know, these things that I don't even think about, but how right. different, how different it was. Um, and I do want to think a little bit about um, Mother's Day. You start, you open mm -hmm. the book talking about um, your own mom was a double major in journalism and ho home economics. And there's this poignant moment where she, where she speaks of being embarrassed by, by, this, you know, having majored in, in home economics. Um, and I think one of the things that you and I were talking about, and one of the things that I think a lot of people have been thinking about over this last year, um, particularly with the pandemic, is, is this, the notion of invisible labor and mm -hmm. what, you know, anyone, let's say mothers, anyone running a home um, and trying to have, make, you know, have a job um, uh, has called into attention the sort of all of the work that has to be done, um, particularly for mothers. And I wonder if you could sort of speak to that, um, how the sort of pandemic has shifted um, or highlighted some of these, these, these aspects. Right, right. Yeah, so I was finished, I started the book in, uh, sub substantially started the book in fall of 2017. And I was finishing it up in, uh, the spring, early summer last year uh, during the pandemic. And I was really just so struck by, and as well, basically I was, well, struck, I was furious uh, by how, you know, someone who covered, mostly covers education, right? The schools close. And the, the fact that all of a sudden, all these people were being, at, told to do their work full-time from home while schools were out. And just this assumption that companies made that you can do your job and that children are invisible. Like, and, you know, it just led me to think about the, yes, the, the extent to which household work is invisible. And something a home economist tried to do from way back is to make it visible, to make it economically meaningful. We all know now, if we didn't before, right? Like you can't have people working for pay without childcare. Mm -hmm. it, someone has to take care of children. It's a job that has to be done. That usually falls on women. And, you know, like one piece of it that drove me that I noticed, I think this probably Claire K. Miller of the New York Times reported this because she's done a lot of work on, on you know, 
unequal household labor, unequal parenting, um, is the fact that when they were looking at families, like with kids, well, yeah, with kids and straight couples and both parents like working from home, they found that the men had offices and the women had set up space in like a common area in the living room or the kitchen or the dining room. And typically the mothers said that they, that was their choice, that they wanted to be in the middle of everything. Uh, what that was, you know, but we are responding to the reality that like their kids were going to be yanking on them. Anyway, their kid would be on the other end of the dining room table doing online school. But it just so struck me, right? Like any individual, and just the, the structural parts of that struck me so strongly, right? Like how, how the extent to which women are trained in our society to do the household work, to do the parenting, to do like the mental labor of like keeping track of everything so that, you know, any given couple you know, is making their own decision about how they raise their children. But like writ large, what does it say when the dads have offices and the moms are set up at the kitchen table? Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, you know, I mean, I guess in thinking about school, um, the book is in a lot of ways about education, about what we learn and how we learn it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a sort of a sentiment that, um, you know, if, if you mentioned having a plumbing, plumbing trouble and someone saying like, go to YouTube, you know, right. um, you know, if you want to learn how to make a chocolate lava cake, you know, watch TikTok. And I wonder, I wonder, I guess I would be curious to hear your perspective on I don't know, to my mind, there's something really excellent uh, about the accessibility of that, that anyone can sort of log on and sort of learn how to sort of, you know, fix a pipe or make a lava cake. Um, there's drawbacks too. And I wonder if you could speak to some of the, the limits of, of that type of learning. Right, right, right. And, you know, I hope that I, you, you're going to get to speak to this one too. Because uh, for <laughs> anyone who's listening who's not familiar with Nina's work, she her first book is about becoming a carpenter after a decade of working as a journalist. And you know she was not a you know hobby carpenter who like picked up. I mean she was quite inexperienced. Um, so so home economics from early on the the first book about home economics. Uh, was published in 1841 by Catherine Beecher, uh, now really best known as the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And she was an educator. She did not have children herself, though she you know, helped care for her siblings at various points. And she thought that uh, domestic, what she called domestic economy should be taught in schools for, for girls. And well, and her point of view was like this, like basically parents weren't qualified to teach home economics because they weren't, they, they weren't going to teach the most up-to-date methods. Um, and there were times, you know, after that, that people thought that parents were not, you know, terribly qualified to teach kids about parenting or household stuff. What I think is useful about learning home economics and shop for that matter, in schools is a few, you know, there's a few reasons. One is that home economics at its best then and now, and it still is around today, um, under usually called family and consumer sciences, uh, is not just about skills for like life skills, like skills around the house. It's about career skills. And it's also about, you know, learning more about, and it's about science and like learning more about how the world works. Is this both macro and micro you know, lens. So you're in a home economics class, the ones that, you know, the best ones I've seen, you're not just learning how to sew on a button. You're learning about say e-textiles, like technolo you know, technology infused textiles. You're learning about why it is that we can get a $5 t-shirt at Walmart and the, you know, lab global labor and economy and environmental impacts of that. And so then, hey, maybe you want to sew on a button and mend your clothes when you know what's behind their, their labor. And you also learn about the, uh, you know, career skill, the career skills of the fashion industry and marketing. 
Um, so that's something that, you know, you can't really get from a YouTube video. And the other thing that strikes me is, you know, you just, you need a certain level of confidence and supplies to learn something off the internet. So I can learn to cook new things off the internet because I'm, I already feel really confident and comfortable about my cooking abilities, which is in large part because my mother is a terrific cook. And so I'd been watching her and participating in that from when I was a kid. Nobody in the house I grew up in like can hammer in a nail to save their lives. <laughs> and so we didn't, I didn't learn anything like that. I didn't have like, you know, I got like hand-me-down pots and pans for my family. I did not get like a cordless drill. Mm -hmm. um, and also because they knew I wasn't interested in that, right? And also like societally speaking, right? Girls are, you know, even though it's been illegal since the 70s to put girls in home ec and boys in shop, you know, we still have these real gendered expectations about these things. So yeah, I just like, yeah, I told when, when Nina and I were talking on the phone about this conversation, uh, I had a plumbing, like a sink plumbing, kitchen sink plumbing issue. Um, and my, uh, my, then boyfriend called, like ended up doing it for me, fixing it for me. And he called his uh, stepfather who was a, you know, man of many skills. And he was like, why did not you look it up on YouTube? And he, he was trying to explain to his stepdad, it's like, she just doesn't, like, she doesn't know how any of that works. <laughs> like she doesn't have the confidence. And you know, you, it's like, I don't have like the tape, right? They always have to like get tape when you're doing plumbing projects, it seems like. <laughs> There's always these supplies and I don't have them. So yeah, I want to hear, I've just been talking for a while, but like, I want to hear Nina, what you think about that on the uh, physical, the, yeah, the, the competence and physical realm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that you're so right about the, the idea of, um, so it's not, I think it's not just, I don't know, you were watching, watching, you know, your mom or your parents cook. I think that's a great, great example because presumably you're watching, you're helping chop, you're learning these skills both by participating in probably a limited way at first and then more and more as you sort of get, get more competent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's, that's in large way how it works. It's that, you know, you get this familiarity with, with the technique and the tools, um, whether it's, uh, carpentry or plumbing or cooking um, or sewing. Um, and I think that, you know, if you're, if you're sort of faced with a, with a plumbing problem and, and, and are just watching a YouTube video with someone who has some expertise and presumably the right tape and the right drill and the right sort of screws or whatever, um, it can be quite daunting, you know? Um, I do think there's something so empowering about uh, developing some comp competence with um, basic tools, you know, totally. um, uh, sort of not not feeling that helplessness if a button pops off or a zipper breaks or um, you know you need to fix a board in your you know staircase or something, um, uh, or you know I mean even if you ride a bike, you know being able to fix your own flat tire. I think there's something really um, again, empowering about not having to A, discard whatever is busted um, or, uh, you know, have, have to pay someone else to, to, to fix it. Um, uh, and it is, it's harder, I think it's, with a lot of these things, it's, it's, it is trickier to sort of grasp it all, um, you know, on a, on a two minute YouTube video. Um, right. uh, I mean, that's not to say you have to become, you know, an apprentice to some, you know, plumber. <laughs> <laughs> um, to learn some of this stuff, but, but yeah, I mean, it is, it's, you know, the, the sort of a matter of time and the right tools and, and learning the techniques. Um, and in this way, I mean, one of the things that people asked me a lot was how do we get more women in the trades? Right. Um, and, and I always, I, you know, I was always sort of baffled by this question. It was really difficult because it's like, if you don't see women in the trades, it's not gonna, it's not gonna feel like an option. And there's, you have a line um, in your book saying, um, no one prepares for a job they don't know exists. Right. Um, and I think one of the things that really struck me um, about the book was how many 
applications home economics actually has. And you spoke to this a little bit, but I think I, you know, I have my middle middle school memories of making scrunchies and soft pretzels. Um, but you know, I mean, one of the, the examples that stuck in my mind was, you know, the nanotechnology involved in 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 protective gear for firemen. You know, I mean, all of these wide ranging applications. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to that sort of like a diversifying the field. Mm -hmm. um, I think with, it, unlike the trades, it's sort of getting more um, people of color and men involved and also just the sort of array of applications. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, because I, again, I just want to emphasize to the audience. I mean, it really like, I had a pretty narrow idea of what this was, you know, a pretty limited view. And this, I mean, this really exploded my idea of it. In a, and I think a really extremely positive way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was one of my my goals in it. So in terms of the range of careers, um, it's so the, the other, th so I said earlier that the founding home economists were trying to do two things. They, and one was to make the, work of the home easier and more scientific. And the other was to turn, to like professionalize the home and take that space that had been, you know, considered women's sphere, take it and develop it into a range of careers that were all important, that were all paid, that and where women would be accepted because of the connection to things they had done in the home. But sometimes these things went fairly far afield. So there's dietetics, for instance, the American Dietetic Association was created by home economists. Um, seamstresses, hotel management, early childhood education, business, like the home economists were employed for decades as you know customer service experts and marketers in not just you know what we think of today as like consumer products like food companies but utility companies um, mm -hmm. utility home economics was a huge field for a long time because you would have um like i write about columbia the columbia gas company which has you know still exists to this day with you know millions of customers and they had people, they sold appliances as well as gas. They had kitchen design experts. They had people writing recipes. They had they hired these women, they called them Betty Newtons to go make house calls when a household bought a new gas appliance to help them maximize it and make the you know, best use of it. And in fact, and this sort of also touches on the empowerment factor of just being able to do something yourself. Um, back in the 1930s, Iowa State had a uh, home economics concentration called household appliances, wherein the women learned how to, you know, take appliances apart, put them back together. And what this really was, was an electrical engineering course. It was this, mm -hmm. you know, girl drag electrical engineering course, wherein they learned a lot about electricity and electronics, but, you know, through these, you know, non-threatening appliances that women used. And in fact, when World War II hit, uh, these women, a bunch of them were recruited by companies that had lost men to defense jobs. So that is, you know, and then the sort of gender question. So, I think this is like a multi-part project. Um, men, so the Title IX, the uh, you know 1970s law that gave us women's basketball, uh, also made it illegal to put girls in home ec and boys in shop to have these gender segregated classes. Um, and it used to be that, I mean, like schools would just not let girls take shop and would not let boys take home ec. So today, um, there are places where, I mean, it's not mandatory as far as I know, HOMAC in any state now. It was for, it was when I was in middle school. So all girls and all boys took both. Um, there are, you know, boys are a noticeable minority in the classes I've seen. But when I've talked to those young men about HOMAC, I said, you know, this used to be considered a girls class. And they thought that was just absolutely ridiculous. They were like, everybody needs to know how to do this stuff. 
which, you know, as usual, the, the middle schoolers are right. <laughs> but, you know, and the FCCLA, the uh, after school organization, youth organization, formerly known as Future Housemaker, Future Homemakers America, is now about one quarter male. And some of the, you know, some of the jobs that you can get through, because it's also still a vocational program, you know, you've got a lot of men in hotel management, you have men in culinary, like that's a pretty gender, gender balanced pursuit. But, you know, it's hard to say. I think that one is, it just seems to be easier. I've noticed this for years. It seems to be easier in our culture to some, like in some ways it seems to be easier to get like Actually, never mind. This I was going to say this is the other way around. It doesn't make sense. I was going to say it's usually easier for like women to be able to do male things than men to be able to do women's things, which is to say like I'm can wear pants, but like you don't see a lot of men wearing skirts. But that's mm-hmm. the other way around in home economics. It seems to but it seems to be easier to get boys to do home ec than women to into the trades and I'm not sure why. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um Got an interesting question from um, Jen in the audience here. Um, I'll read it. Uh, when you were researching home ec in schools today, were there regional differences, such as more home ec in some parts of the country than others? And is this a high school class now or a middle school one? Oh, those are great questions. So it is more. It is more. It is both a high school and a middle school class. Uh, it depends. Um, I think the places that see it more as life skills, it's often a middle school class. The places that are really tapping into the career skills, it's more of a high school class because you're not doing a lot of career stuff with middle schoolers just across the board. Uh, And it is both. It's the, um, the federal law that well, it doesn't govern all govern all of vocational education, but like the federal law that applies to vocational education started in the 1910s, and home economics was in fact the only vocation it recognized for girls at the time that it was you know putting money towards. And the law, you know, has gone through many permutations, exists today. It's called Perkins, and it still funds family and consumer sciences as a career a career class. What I saw, so I did not get to visit school classes in like every part of the country, unfortunately, because I just had, you know, limits on time and, you know, how much material I could deal with. So I, but there's more in the South and the Midwest, for sure, there's more home economics uh, in the South and the Midwest. Hmm. And that's, and there's more uh, members of FCCLA, but the same token, there's, you know, the, the Northeast, uh, yeah, the Northeast just doesn't have as many participants. Uh-huh. What do you credit that to? Hmm. I am, I genuinely, like, I think anything I could really go to would be uh, more based on like regional stereotypes than mm-hmm. on reporting. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. don't want to, I don't want to, uh, make any assumptions there. I can't say that, you know, at last count, um, more than 3 million U.S. public school students were taking home economics in any given year. Uh, Plus there are more than 100 colleges and universities that still offer a major in home ec. And this is not like counting the ones that offer majors in fields that got their start in home economics. Like there's dietetics, nutrition programs that are not part of home economics departments. Again, you know, you're not, the reason people don't know about this is because the field starting in the late sixties, when it, you know, the stereotypes against home ec were really building, a lot of places changed the name of the program to gain more respect. So it might be called human development or family and consumer sciences. Uh, And, you know, these colleges are all over the country and they certainly are still strong, especially strong in some of the places where home ec began, such as land-grant colleges and historically Black universities. Um, But, you know, it's in other, like, state, there's a lot in, like, state colleges, state universities. And this is to say nothing of the, you know, people all around the world who also study home economics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there are many amazing and ambitious people in the book, um, mm. particularly women. And, I, and I'm curious to know if you, of all the sort of um, figures that you write about or interview, if you have a personal favorite. I don't have a person like my personal favorite sort of changes from from day to day but I feel like you know maybe on on Mother's Day it'd be fun to talk about uh Flora Rose and um Martha Van Rensselaer of Cornell uh otherwise known as Miss Van Rose uh because they they were they co-founded the Cornell College of Home Economics which today is the College of Human Ecology still around um, and they, I mean, they came from very, from very different backgrounds. Martha grew up in Western New York. Uh, she was well-educated for the time, uh, ran for school commissioner and won well, as soon as women were allowed, they, they opened up, you know, like a, this, this school related office to women and she, and she became it. And she discovered like the plight of the farm woman and these women who were just so isolated, working so hard and they were so lonely. Like there were people who didn't have mail delivery, you know, who wouldn't see anybody outside their household for three weeks. Something that I feel like we can relate to a little bit more like after a year of COVID, like I certainly couldn't when I started the research. Uh, mm -hmm. Flora Rose, on the other hand, was a society girl in Denver, and she was bored, and she like ran off to go to college, basically, and discovered nutrition. And the two of them were hired by Cornell uh, sequentially to create this department out of nothing. Um, and they were also uh, from... The, the documentation is lim about like if some of their life, lives, there's a little bit limited uh, because, you know, they, their, their letters to each other as part of their home ec business survived, but any letters they wrote to each other that were just personal have not because people don't archive women's things. Um, but they were life partners. They lived together. They ran the department together. They were, you know, obviously in love when Martha died in the thirties, Flora got all of these letters, you know, addressing her as like the grieving widow. And she would write back, you know, on letterhead talking about how much, like how empty the home was without Martha. Um, and it's funny because they never, you know, they did not, someone asked them at one point about children, about how they didn't have children. And uh, one of them wrote, like, oh, we all have, we have, our child is, is a big bouncing home economics department that <laughs> demands much time and attention. Uh, and they also were, I mean, they were fascinating for many reasons. They both got involved in World War I food conservation and were really instrumental in raising the profile of home ec nationally and internationally. Uh, but one thing I think about is, you know, for this field from early on was both, you know, there was this tension at the heart of it is, was it liberating or was it repressive to develop this fear of women's work? Which, you know, they didn't actually think, the, the founders did not think there was anything like inherently feminine about the work of the home. It's just like, it was women who were doing it. Um, and they, you know, it was both really. It was both all for many decades. And the women who wanted it to be liberating had to partner with people, often men, who thought that this was a great like thing for women to do because women should be in the home. So at Cornell, for instance, in order to have this jobs engine, this research engine, this, you know, enormous, this powerhouse of of opportunities, they had to uh, cater dinners for the university. So they had, it was just ridiculous. Like this, the, the president of the university had once said, cooks on the Cornell faculty, never. <laughs> and because that's what he thought home economics was. He thought it was like, oh, cooks on the Cornell faculty. But they, you know, this is Ithaca, New York in like 19, 
10 and they don't have, you know, this is long before the Moosewood restaurant guys like started up. So they would bring in these dignitaries and they would have no place to take them for dinner. So they would call on Miss Van Rose to provide dinner. And which was just, so yeah, here they were like trying to get their work done and all of a sudden they have to drop everything and cater a dinner for fancy people. Unbelievable. And they did it, like they did it because they felt that's what they had to do. Mm -hmm. Um, there's another cool question here from the audience from Susan, um, who writes, enjoying reading your book and congratulations for the wonderful reviews. As working from home grows through re remote jobs, is it a cycle back to the early days of home e economics, where you live and where you work are the same place? What is the future of home economics in a society with a growing remote workforce? That is a really great question. Um, so, uh, you know, one one piece of one piece of the answer is that home. You know, okay, home is a workplace. Home has always been a work. There's a there are a bunch of different pieces to this to my response. One is that uh, one of the projects of home economists through the 1930s was uh, trying to standardize household employment, and that's what they you know referred to by, you know, people who were working as housekeepers, as nannies, as maids, you know, coming, working out of other people's homes. And they really tried to standardize this. Ellen Swallow Richards was the first, one of the founders of home economics and the first woman to go to MIT. So, which I found that out immediately just, you know, blew my mind about what home economics had been about. Um, she was really adamant. Like if you have somebody working out of your house, they should, their work should, they should be just as standardized as that of a factory worker because all sorts of women were, you know, in the industrial revolution had left household employment to go work in factories. And even though factories were definitely no fun, what they loved was the greater autonomy and the fact that they could go to their job be and leave and be done. Whereas if you were working in somebody else's home, it was like, you know, Downton Abbey, right? Where you were getting up at the crack of dawn and on call all day and all night. Uh, and the industrial revolution part, you know, in a way I feel, in the way I think that the, this rise of remote work has reversed the conditions under which home economics came about, which is that home ec came out of the industrial revolution. And this is another you know, observation of Ellen's. It's like the it pre-industrial revolution, the house was a working economic unit and everybody recognized that. And it, you know, we didn't have mass production. So there was a lot more home production and work, you know, workshop level production. But with the industrial revolution, the home lost, like all of the jobs that had been interesting, let like became paid wage labor outside in another building somewhere, leaving only the stuff that was really boring. So that's what it was, was an, you know, an observation that Ellen Swallow Richards made really early on was, you know, with the only tasks left at home were, she called it something like the dreary work never done. <laughs> like it wasn't, it wasn't interesting. It wasn't like a great way to, you know, it didn't feel particularly, it didn't feel as fulfilling, she thought. So I, but at the same, you know, on the other, other, other hand, I do think that us being at home so much has led people to really think so much more, right? About the environment in our homes. And that was something like later on, there's a wonderful businesswoman named Satinik St. Marie, who is now in her nineties and retired. She was the head of home economics at JC Penney for many years. And she became their first female vice president, uh, which was a uh, well-known, at the time path, you know, oftentimes the first woman in upper management at a company had been the home, the chief home economist. And she wrote a textbook in the early seventies called homes are for people. 
And it was all about how interior design, which has also been a part of home economics, which nowadays actually is more about office design, you know, commercial interior design than home interior design. But it was all about how you should be thinking about your house, not in terms of, you know, the keeping up with the Joneses idea that we have of like the 50s and 60s, but functionally, like what should your house be like for to to enable the life that you want to have in it, like the life that the personal relationships, the way you want to spend your time, like that's what a home is about. And I think about that now, you know, with, you know, the question of where are kids learning from home, where are people working from home? Yeah. Everyone who, I mean, I rearranged my house. I don't know about you guys, but like we rearranged, I, you know, used to have a guest room and now the guest room is an office because haven't had any guests and I, my co-working space shut down and I was working from the kitchen table. And after I read that study, I was like, I'm working from the kitchen table. What does that say about how seriously I'm taking my own work? <laughs> <laughs> but generally speaking, you know, home economics, people ask me, it's like, is it about like, oh, everyone's making sourdough bread. Isn't that very home ecky? And on the one hand it is because it's, a great, you know, you, you know, it's good to know how to make your own bread. It can be more delicious. It can be way cheaper than buying the comparable product. It can be more nourishing even. It can give you a sense of satisfaction. It smells nice. It can be a way to spend time with somebody and your, somebody else in your household. Um, but, you know, the home economist also thought like, what is necessary, said they, what's necessary for a house to be a home? And everything else, like the laundry, right? Do you have to do it? Do you have to do it yourself? Does it matter? And this is something that like, they just would not have been, I feel like they would not have been into those like decorative pillows on your bed. Mm -hmm. I hate decorative. I, I personally, I'm just gonna say this guys, I hate the decorative pillows on the bed. Like where do you put them? My mom has a chair for the decorative pillows on the bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's an interesting distinction because I, I mean, I think, you know, you bringing up sourdough and, and even sewing masks um, during the mm. pandemic. And there's, there's this funny distinction um, where it's like, oh, you know, like all this kind of social media, um, like, oh, I've made this beautiful pot of homemade jam and it's got a pretty bow around it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here's this, here's this, here's this dress I made. And there's, Again, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think it really is cool to be able to 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 make your own food, to make your own clothes, mm -hmm. um, and there's also great privilege involved with that. You know, um, I I make I make wooden spoons, and um, it's a it's a it's a deeply pleasurable experience um, in doing that. And you knit, is that true? Yeah. yeah wow. Right now. <laughs> Um, uh, and there is something I think, you know, to, to sort of put your mind in your hands and to, to, to create something that wasn't there before there was, there is something I think invaluable about that. Um, um, and then there is this line between, you know, there's that, there's that sort of, um, endeavor. And then there's, there's like, oh man, there's grime, there's grime around the rim, rim of my tub, you know, right. um, those much less glamorous jobs. Um, uh, and so I guess, I don't know, to me, I guess both your book and this, this moment we've all been living through has sort of awakened me a little bit more to the subtleties of those, as subtleties and non-subtleties of those, those differences. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the things, one of the things, I mean, you do the hardest thing, which is you make the book look effortless <laughs> and there's a magnificent amount of information in it. And I'm actually, I, I'm quite um, amazed to hear that you, you said you started in 2017. Yeah. Yeah. God. Wow. I mean, so I guess I'd be curious to know, um, where did the research start? What were some of the challenges? What were some of the sort of triumphs of it? Um, mm -hmm. because it really, it's like, there is so much information here. And again, you, 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 you make it look easy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Now, after reading your book, I was like, Okay, great. I made it look easy, but like my book is not poetic and Nina's book is poetic. <laughs> uh, so I, so I started this book, uh, you know, people often want, are curious about where I got this idea. And, you know, the idea was, I forgot that my mother had double majored in home ec and journalism when I uh, started this 
book, which is hilarious. Like, obviously the apple didn't fall like terribly far. Um, but I got into the subject because I wanted to write about education and history and race, gender, and class. And I, and my, I wanted it to connect to my hobbies because I had heard, well, I was, uh, applying for the Knight Wallace Fellowship. And the first time around, uh, I was a finalist with a totally different book idea. And they asked me how I looked, you know, what my hobbies were. I said I cooked and they said, oh, the University of Michigan has this amazing culinary collection in, in its library. And I just like, I could feel myself light up. So I was like, I would love to use that. And, you know, more generally, I was like, oh, I, this should really connect to my hobbies as well as my like work because writing a book. I hear writing a book is a big project. It is. Um, and I decided, to, and I just put all this in the hopper. And a couple of weeks later, I was like, you know, oh, wait, home economics, like the class that taught girls how to cook. And then, you know, I started doing research and found out that it was so much, so much more than, than that. Uh, and so I started the research. I mean, I did use the culinary collection though, ironically, not as much as I thought I would um, in that there is an extraordinary amount, like thank you libraries of digitized material and everything that, you know, the culinary collection at the University of Michigan is amazing. It's also like archive, you, you have to go there and you can't use a pen, you can use a pencil, like, you know, archival, practices, but so much of what's in that collection and so much of what's in other collections has been digitized uh, through Google, through other projects. And because of the University of Michigan, I had access to this enormous number of databases, enormous, unreal. Like I got to check for, they had access to a collection that somebody has put together of KKK newsletters and newspapers, like racist, white supremacist, historical media from, you know, year whatever to year whatever. So I could go through and look up when I was looking for, you know, racism and home economics. I could go in there and like look to see if there was anything specific, which actually there wasn't so much like as I thought. Um, on the other hand, I knew that I was looking for evidence of eugenics in HOMAC because eugenics was extremely widespread in the 1910s, the first half of the 20th century uh, in the, and it was prevalent in these like progressive political social work circles that home economics was part of. Uh, as we have learned, you know, talk recently, you know, recently about uh, Margaret Sanger, for instance, the birth control advocate who had been seen, remembered as this, you know, progressive feminist hero. Well, she also was, you know, supported birth control because she thought that some people shouldn't, like, you know, undesirable people shouldn't have children. So I went looking for eugenics and along with just being able to, you know, search for these terms and all of these different, through all of these different databases that I had access to, um, through Half a Trust, which by the way, anybody can access Half a Trust Digital Library. You can't do full download unless you have like an academic login, but they have all of these old magazines that have been digitized. And I, knew that John Harvey Kellogg of, you know, Kellogg's uh, in Battle, the Battle Creek Sanitarium was a eugenicist. And I thought, oh, he was a health nut. Maybe he had a home, you know, some sort of home connection. And so I found his good health magazines in half the trust. And I went through and lo and behold, they did have a chief dietitian for the Battle Creek Sanitarium who became the head of their home economics school who wasn't, and she was a member of the American Home Economics Association. She was a co-founder of the American Dietetics Association. She did terrific work for women dietitians in the military, for dietitians in the military. And she, there was nothing that I found of hers that uh, 
advocated for eugenics, but you know, she wrote these cooking columns that ran alongside this like horrible racist claptrap. Like I decided not to quote it, like it's horrible, like really the worst of the worst. So like, I just, so I, which I guess also just leads me to sort of the big challenge of the book was I, well, the, the great joy and the great challenge was I went down every single rabbit hole I could find. <laughs> And, you know, it was necessary to be able to flesh out these stories. Um, Margaret Murray Washington, who I write about, was the uh, Booker T. Washington's wife. She was born uh, either at the very end of the Civil War or just afterwards in Mississippi. She was a Black woman who earned a bachelor's degree and ran home economics at Tuskegee. You know, I went to, there's two dissertations written about her. Like I went to Tuskegee and dug around to see what they had about from the archives about her. Like it was just all an exercise of really trying to put together all of these pieces and then to like boil it down into one sentence because, you know, I had a hundred that my contract was for a book of a hundred thousand words, which included endnotes and like, wow. yeah. So that's where it's, you know, useful to have to be in a reporter who, you know, knows how to write short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, that's, it's, it's, it is amazing. It's remarkable to me. And just hearing about the sort of sleuthery involved, yeah. you know, um, and the sort of the different ways that things light up. Um, I don't know. I love that. I love those sort of connections that, that you make. And I think really, I mean, it is, it's a mind expanding amount of information without feeling overwhelming. And I think that's such, that's such a difficult thing to achieve. And you really like really nailed that. Um, we're sort of closing in on the final minutes. Um, Pat for Magic City is reminding me that um, Norton is giving a free embroidery. Oh, right. <laughs> um, so if you, Danielle, um, want to choose a number between one and 20 um, okay. and the uh, corresponding attendee will Win, win the... Great. And I have not looked at the attendee list, so I don't know. I'm just going to choose a number and I don't know who's it going to be. Also, I should say that this is a home ec themed embroidery pattern that I made when I should have been working on a book. Um, <laughs> uh, let's go with seven. Cool. Um, there was a comment that came in through the QA, was um, not so much a question, but the, the idea of um, speaking to the theme of, of how you spend your time, you know, mm -hmm. this sort of repeated theme of, of where, where we allocate our attention. And that's something I think about a lot um, in, uh, in my work. And I think that it, it does, I mean, your work too really speaks to that sort of what is demanded of us, where we can make these choices. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think that was, I don't know, I think that that's an interesting way to think about all of this. Um, yeah, yeah, geez. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, I, I'm just getting stuck on like the uh, uh, Annie Dillard line, right? About like how we spend our days is of course how we spend our lives, mm -hmm. which is such a depressing, which is such a beautiful and such a real sentiment, but also so depressing whenever I'm like, you know, procrastinating by like, you know, watching biathlon on YouTube and like playing Ken Ken. <laughs> 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 I guess you know what I to the home economics lens of and yeah, you know, it 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 is truly uh, humbling. It was humbling to do this research and realize how much more home economist like the great home economists all along, how much more they have accomplished than like I do, how much more they fit into their time. Um, I mean, Gladys Gary Vaughn, who is, she was, uh, she grew up in Florida and I, you know, write about her in the like chapters about, well, a few of the chapters. She was, um, Gosh, she's in her late seventies now, I believe. She's still working. She's still working for, I think it's the USDA and she's like Office of Civil Rights of the USDA. She ran like a major volunteer organization. She was a home economics teacher at her, you know, the start of her career. Um, 
in the segregated South. She was the first black woman to be a professional staffer for the American Home Economics Association. And like in the years between like 1967 and like 1973, I think she earned her master's degree and her doctorate and she had children and she taught and she like moved, like did like multi-state moves like three times. <laughs> it's like, a lot. How? How? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Um, that, that feels like a, a good motivating moment <laughs> to wrap this up. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really encourage everyone, if you haven't already bought the book, it really is, um, I, I, it, it, it really blew my mind. It truly did. Um, it's, it's, it's excellent, um, and mind expanding. Um, uh, thank you, Danielle, for have, having me and, uh, Magic City Books. Thank you guys as well. Yes, thank you for having, thank you, Magic City. Thank you, Nia. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending a Zoom event on a, well, here in New Orleans, it's a beautiful Sunday. I don't know what it's like wherever, wherever you guys may be. But thank you, yes, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Yeah.